Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started at the hour, so very soon. Hope you all get settled so we can get started. Okay, it's at the hour. So hello everybody, and welcome to Zero Emissions Solutions Conference, session on MRI Climate Talks on food waste and anaerobic digestion. My name is Eri Saikawa, and I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences and the Director of Science, Policy, and Community-Engaged Research at the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University. Emory Climate Talks, in partnership with the Department of Environmental Sciences and the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University, is a student-centered initiative creating opportunities for undergraduate and graduate students to become the agents of change in the climate change movement. Higher education brings an essential voice to efforts on climate change, and we have been proud to support bringing students between 2015 and 2019 to the United Nations climate change negotiations. As the world continues to navigate a new normal amidst COVID-19, Memory Climate Talks has been eager to keep important conversations going about the human impact on climate. This year, we decided against sending students, but instead have supported activists and alumni attend the COP26. We are thrilled that we are able to be a part of the Zero Emissions Solutions Conference organized by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and I hope that you have been enjoying the conference so far. This is the last session of the Zero Emission Solutions Conference, and we'll be talking about the importance of food waste from various perspectives. I'm so very excited to have three very esteemed panelists and the two Emory students who will be moderating this session. We have Kiara Brust, who is a first year master's student in the Global Environmental Health Program at the Rolling School of Public Health at Emory University. We also have Claire McCarthy, who is a third year Emory undergraduate student studying environmental sciences. We will have a Q&A section at the end, but please feel free to post any questions you might have in the questions tab uh, that you see at the bottom at any time. I'm sure you're ready to hear from the speakers now, uh, so let's get started. Hello, everybody. As uh, Ari said, I'm a master's student at Roland School of Public Health at Emory University, specifically studying global environmental health. For my bachelor's degree, I studied biology and did research on the consequences of climate change on coral reefs. Um, I became most interested on climate change when I watched this documentary called Plastic Paradise. I highly recommend it. Um, and I'll now leave it to Claire to introduce herself. Hi everyone, so I'm a third year in Emory College studying environmental science and I really first became interested in climate change when I attended a summer program in high school and I was just really shocked by what an intersectional social justice issue it is and how broad re reaching it is and it will affect everyone. Um, and I'm specifically interested in climate activism and I'm involved with the Climate Reality Project. All right, so today's session will focus on policy and current interventions for food waste. We will be learning about the kinds of laws that regulate the production and uses of food waste, along with the current food waste recycling strategies, such as anaerobic digestion, which converts food waste to energy, and vermiculture, which uses the power of worms to create soil amendments. Uh, globally, about a third of all food is produced, all food produced is lost to waste. So now is the time to learn from industry innovators and support them as we tackle this major issue. Uh, this session will start with introductions by the panelists, followed by a facilitated discussion about their knowledge and practices involving food waste. We will conclude with an audience Q&A session. If you think of any questions throughout the session, please don't hesitate to write it in the questions tab. We have several people monitoring the questions tab and we will address your questions as soon as the Q&A session begins. So without further ado, we will start our session by introducing Mr. John Hanselman. Hello everyone. 
Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to um, read a brief bio um, as an introduction. So Mr. John Hanselman is the founder and chief strategy officer of Vanguard Renewables, a leading organization for the development of organics to renewables energy projects. By establishing anaerobic digesters on site with dairy farms, Vanguard Renewables is able to recycle organic waste and turn it into renewable energy and low carbon fertilizer. They are committed to reducing on-farm and food-generated greenhouse gas emissions from waste by 95%. Mr. Hanselman has more than 30 years of experience leading renewable energy and environmental companies. He works alongside Vanguard's farm partners to enhance regenerative agricultural practices for the ultimate purpose of combating climate change. Um, so now, Mr. Hanselman, it'd be great if you could please introduce yourself and your organization, especially your work as it relates to food waste. Great. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, and I will attempt to share some uh, slides with everyone, give us a little bit of an introduction as to what we're doing at Vanguard. Um, so we started Vanguard Renewables uh, about eight years ago when we realized um, the potential power of organic recycling and uh, understanding that, that we could actually empower a circularity where we could take organic materials, um, divert them from landfills and incinerators, uh, take them back to farms and other locations uh, where we would build anaerobic digesters, where we could extract uh, the renewable natural gas, the biogas uh, that was resident in those, those um, streams and convert it into either electricity uh, or renewable natural gas um, to be injected into the local gas grid. Um, and then to also produce uh, the a liquid fraction that turns out to be an extremely um, high nutrient, low carbon fertilizer source that we can use uh, on our farms and gave um, back to all of our farm partners as, as part of their journey um, towards regenerative agriculture as, as a base process um, and theory within their own um, farming techniques. Um, this is a, a quick little illustration of just um, how that circularity works. And, and the thing that was stunning to us is, is the idea that, that food waste and organic materials um, in general are very unique uh, in the world of recycling and that they're one of the few streams out there where the disposal and the recycling of that material really changes uh, the, the properties of whether it becomes a really um, awful and, and corrosive greenhouse gas or becomes a very useful um, negative carbon fuel type. Um, and I think there's very few other materials that can have such immediate and, and certain impact uh, on reducing the impact of climate change. Um, what we have found over the years, uh, when we started, it was we, we kind of figured everyone would beat a path to our door as we, we allowed them to take uh, that. Um, it turned out to be much more complex. Uh, it, it is a disruptive effort. Um, there is a history of, uh, or, or no history of food waste recycling. And there's a history of waste management uh, in the United States that we needed to kind of redirect. Um, it's been remarkable in our ability to get partners, um, really wonderful partners I mean, folks like Starbucks and Unilever and Chobani um, to help us in that um, mission. And I'll talk a little bit later about about how we've all kind of come together under a new um, farm powered strategic alliance uh, to try and bring the voices of large food manufacturers, retailers, and distributors um, to the table and to get them to make a public commitment to really try and empower that circularity that we talked about a second ago. One of the things that was really critical for us to understand uh, or, or became really apparent as we were building out the systems uh, is that this was a disruptive practice and it was something where we needed to build the infrastructure locally within the community to get the food waste and the other organic materials um, from the generators, from the households um, to the farms uh, and get it into our digesters to be converted into the renewable energy. Um, that building of that infrastructure also requires, and, and I know a Professor um, Bradley will talk about this in a minute, policies that help direct that change. I think everyone understands the quantity, or at least beginning to understand the quantity of food waste that's resident within our system. What is it was less clear is, is how to get it out um, and get it recycled. And that's, that's really been a big part of our kind of investing in the infrastructure. Um, the good news is, is that that demand for renewable natural gas and re demand for renewable electricity 
um, that can be derived from the recycling of that food waste has increased um, significantly over the past eight years as we've built out this infrastructure. And even over the last 24 months, um, the pressure, interestingly, from Wall Street on, on major corporates to create um, an ESG program, to create a, a sustainability program, and to use science-based targets um, has really changed the way that, that folks have, have started talking to us about acquiring um, the renewable energies that we make. This is just a, a, a nice graphic example of one of our latest farms. Uh, we were honored to win the most sustainable farm uh, in the United States this past year. Um, and it really is because of that circularity. And on this farm, we're able to take uh, waste from folks like uh, Ben and Jerry's and Cabot's, uh, take it into the farm, recycle it, um, create that wonderful fertilizer uh, that we then put back on the fields, that, feel, those, that feeds all of the, the local resin uh, herd of, of cows. Uh, that milk then goes out to make that, that cheese and that, that ice cream that we all love so much. Um, and then continue that circle um, in perpetuity. In, in addition to that here, we're also removing phosphorus from that circularity, which has been resonant and creating such a huge problem for the Otter Creek watershed and Lake Champlain, the, the local waterways. Um, and that I think is another key part of, of what has to happen to the industry, the anaerobic digestion industry as we go forward too, is really monitoring both the input and the output. And, and here we've, we've kind of taken the next step forward, we think, in, in how we do that. Um, as I said earlier, we, we did, we were fortunate right before the pandemic uh, to form the Farm Powered Strategic Alliance. And, and for us, this is kind of the natural evolution of how large corporates can really make a change. Um, and a very, very small set of changes on their side in terms of redirecting the waste stream. Um, our, our mantra to them is that waste is a mindset um, and that their organics really aren't a waste. They're just a misplaced resource. And so if we can get that um, from them and get them to stop sending to landfills or incineration um, and get that into a place where we can actually harvest all of the potential out of that material, um, it makes a really significant change. And that's been a, a wonderful adoption since the founding members, Starbucks, Unilever, and the Dairy Farmers of America. Um, we've subsequently added uh, Chobani, Stonyfield, um, and several others who are about to be announced as well. So it's been a really exciting growth for us and something where we see the corporate um, component being actually a huge mover um, in the marketplace. The thing that's so wonderful about renewable natural gas is it is a drop-in replacement. So you can decarbonize and, and replace the reliance on fossil natural gas um, simply with the, the flick of a pen. Um, there is no change necessary uh, in any of the structure uh, or operational structure with anyone who is using it. So whether it's in a household or in a large factory, um, replacing uh, fossil gas with renewable natural gas is both quick um, and extremely effective. Uh, and it's effective because of that carbon. Um, and I, I won't spend the time to kind of go through the calculation of, of how renewable natural gas is, is measured in terms of carbon intensity. But suffice to say that the, the standards now, we thought, and I spent the better part of a decade working on solar prior to this, um, you mm -hmm. think of net zero energy um, and in wind and solar, being able to have carbon negative, actually healing energy um, that comes from the farm. Um, that's the thing that, that's most exciting about what we've been able to pull together. And so we're, we're see this as something that, that's not only um, a US phenomena, but also should be a national phenomena. It is, it is well into its maturity in um, the EU and the UK. Um, and we think that there's, there's lots and lots of uh, possibility and potential throughout the, throughout the world. Thank you so much, John, for explaining all of that for us. That was, I already have so many questions for you, but um, I will leave those towards the end. Um, so now we have Emily Broadleaf. So Professor Emily Leaf is a clinical professor of law the faculty director of the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic, and the deputy director of the Harvard Law School Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. 
In 2011, Professor Brad Lee founded the first law school clinic in the United States devoted to identifying legal and policy solutions to address the health, economic, and environmental challenges facing our food system. Her work has been covered in the New York Times, The Guardian, and several other distinguished news outlets. She was also named by Fortune and Food and Wine to their list of 2016's most innovative women in food and drink. Professor Broadleaf was co-founder and co-chair of the Board of Trustees for the Academy of Food Law and Policy from 2014 to 2019. She is now the faculty supervisor for the Harvard Mississippi Delta Project and Harvard Food Law, <clears throat> Food Law Society and supervisor of the National Food Law Student Network. So Emily, if you could please introduce yourself and your organization, especially as it connects to food waste. Wonderful, thank you, Kiara, and um, thank you, Ari, for sharing slides. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm really delighted to be invited. And I also, in addition to thanking the organizers, I wanna thank John for the nice shout out for the importance of policy, which is what I'm gonna talk about as well. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to explain a little bit about um, what the Food Law and Policy Clinic is, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of our work in the food waste area. Um, so the Food Law and Policy Clinic is a um, action-based learning program at Harvard Law School where we do kind of three main things. One is um, educate law students about the laws that regulate the food system. So I do that both in the classroom and in a hands-on project-based learning. Um, and we do everything. I mean, the interesting thing about food is that there's so many different agencies and laws that, that touch the food system and in many ways aren't very coordinated. Um, so we talk about food safety, we talk about labeling and marketing, we talk about the First Amendment, which is um, a lot of, offers a lot of protection for speech in the US, which can get in the way of some of the ways that we might wanna regulate labeling and commerce. Um, we talk about agricultural subsidies um, and the environment. Uh, and then the second part of it is, is that we provide legal and policy advice to clients, which are nonprofits, government agencies, coalitions, um, social enterprise. And we really focus on four areas, which you can see on this slide, sustainable and equitable food production, food access and nutrition, community food system planning, and then reducing food waste and increasing food recovery, which I'll talk mostly about today. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, you'll see here um, images of just some of the different projects and clients that we've worked with in these four areas. Um, so you can see one picture here, which is a, a project we worked on a few years ago with Navajo Nation that was really a, a kind of lengthy toolkit going through all different areas of the food system and really laying out where um, Navajo Nation has power to make certain policies um, versus where they need to defer to the federal government or to state governments. Um, uh, we have in the middle, you see a logo for a report we did, Doctoring Our Diet, which was um, within our nutrition portfolio and was really working on trying to increase um, education for health professionals in the U.S. around food and diet, which right now is not a big part of um, the education of doctors or other health professionals which means that we're sort of missing an opportunity in terms of the health side. Um, and then many of these are work in our food waste space, which is what I wanna really focus on. The last thing I'll say in addition to the projects that we do is that a lot of my work is building the field of food law and policy. And you heard from Kiara in my intro, um, I've helped found the Academy of Food Law and Policy and the National Food Law Student Network. Um, we're really trying to build out um, knowing the importance of law and policy to the food system. We're trying to build the networks in this space that are um, working on it. And um, I started the first clinic, but it's lonely doing something without peers and partners collaborating together. So that's been a lot of my work as well. Next slide. So now turning to some of the work that we do on food waste. Um, I like this map. It's a little bit outdated, but I love it because it shows that Food waste is really a global phenomenon, and, um, and that's one important thing. And then the other important piece is that the places where food is wasted along the supply chain vary from region to region. So what you can see here is the blue circles in every region show food loss, 
which is um, food that's lost really on the farm or immediately post-harvest. Um, and often that's issues with um, cold storage or uh, you know, harvesting capacity or really getting food cooled down immediately off the farm. By contrast, the orange circles show food waste. So this is food that's come from the farm. It's gotten manufactured and processed and packaged and trucked or shipped all over to where it's going and gets wasted really at retail, at restaurants and food service or in people's homes. And the interesting thing you can see is that North America is the one region where food waste at that those levels of the chain exceeds food loss. And in Europe, they're quite close, those two circles. So there's really, um, you know, it's a global challenge, but the solutions often are going to vary from place to place. Next slide. Um, so, you know, I, one of the, the, because of sort of the issues in this area um, and the importance of this to, um, you know, to food systems, to hunger, to, you know, getting food to people in need and also to climate. Um, so the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found that about eight to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from food waste. So this has become a really big and growing part of the work that we do in the clinic. And what does that look like to work on this? We work at all different levels of government at the state and local level in the US. We do tracking of different bills and we provide direct assistance to states. At the federal level in the US, we've worked on a US food loss and waste action plan that I'll mention more in a moment. Um, and then we looked at the US Farm Bill where we provide subsidies to agriculture and food producers and we've spent a lot of time in both the last farm bill and the one that will be coming in the next few years, really drilling down into what opportunities there are within that to make sure that the food we're supporting goes to people's plates rather than getting wasted or to things like compost and anaerobic digestion or animal feed rather than going to a landfill. And then now on the global level, we're doing some work in particular where we're um, analyzing and comparing laws across countries to find the best models for laws that reduce food waste and increase food donation. Next slide. So I'll just, as two examples, I mentioned one of the things we did here in the US earlier this year, along with um, NRDC, ReFed and the World Wildlife Fund, we put out a, a joint um, US food loss and waste policy action plan. So the four organizations drafted this together, but we have several dozen signatories, including both uh, local governments, nonprofits, and then many businesses like Unilever, um, and several hotel chains, Kroger's. Um, so what we what we did was we really said at this moment when we're really focused on climate and there's a real increased attention on it, what do we think that Congress and the U.S. administration can do? And we really drilled into five key areas that you can see here. One is really policies to invest in prevention and keeping food out of the landfills. We have a couple different areas where we can increase donation, um, showing leadership of the US, educating consumers, again, in light of the fact that so much waste in the US happens at the household level, as you saw in an orange circle being bigger than the blue in the US, um, and then standardizing date labeling in the US, which has been proven to be one of the most cost-effective ways that we could reduce food waste here. And then the second project I'll profile briefly on the next slide, is our Global Food Donation Policy Atlas. So this has been a real pleasure to work on. We connected with an organization called the Global Food Banking Network. They provide um, funding and technical assistance to um, food recovery organizations all over the world, primarily in um, lower income and middle income countries. And we work with them to partner with food banks and food bank networks in different countries and with their buy-in to really analyze the laws in different countries and really map out um, on some of the key areas of law where countries have best practices and where they can learn from one another. So the next slide shows what the areas are that we're examining. And what we found is that law and policy play a really big role. They can be a barrier, for example, one of the areas is food safety. In many, many countries, the food safety laws don't mention food donation anywhere. And they make it really difficult for businesses to know what they're allowed to do and for food banks to know what they're allowed to recover and donate. So that area serves as a barrier. Similarly, liability serves as a barrier. 
Um, companies are very concerned that if they donate food and someone becomes ill, that that would end up causing them to pay out for a penalty, even if they handle that food safely, they followed all the rules. Um, so many countries, including the US, have passed laws that provide protection. On the flip side, law can be an incentive. So tax incentives has been, um, in many of the countries we've looked at, they have all different levels and there's definitely some best and not as good practices, but um, making, really offsetting the cost of donating food can encourage people to, can encourage organizations to make that part of their practices. And so the next slide just shows um, in one area what this looks like. So this is when you, when you can use the map to look at liability protection, what you can see is countries that are highlighted in green have a strong policy like the US and Argentina. Um, and then in yellow means a moderate policy, orange means more limited, and then red means that that country doesn't have a policy on this area. Um, and we've also been hosting um, webinar conferences with government officials from all these countries and others to talk about some of the best practices and provide peer-to-peer -peer learning. And what we've really found is that often in this area, there's a lot of interest in making change and there's not a lot of opportunity for countries to learn together on the nitty gritty of some of these policies that are most important. So it's been really exciting and rewarding. We've finished 14 countries so far, which you can see on this map. And we have six countries underway um, that we're working on right now. We'll be kind of continuing every few months to add more countries to the map. We also have really detailed information on the laws and recommendations for all of those. Um, so next slide is just sort of a thank you. And, and I'll just finish by saying, um, you know, this was kind of giving a couple examples, but I think what we're seeing across the board is that um, in particular where there's really innovative ideas and opportunities. They're often um, hit up against questions of law. And what I see our role is doing is both educating students who can go on and be leaders in this field, but also providing real time technical assistance to um, organizations and governments that are, um, that are trying to really figure out the best path forward to make the food system healthier, more sustainable and more equitable. So I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much for that introduction, Emily. I'm excited to um, hear more about your work throughout the panel. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our final panelist. Mr. Wayne Harper is the founder and managing director of Urban Farms Recycling, a waste management and commercial vermiculture operation. By providing a recycling solution for their food wastes, Urban Farms Recycling helps companies reduce costs and lower their environmental impact. Urban Farms' mission is to improve agricultural production and soil health using sustainable systems. Mr. Harper is also an executive committee member of Organics Recycling Association of South Africa. He is also a mentor for Endeavor South Africa for its Accelerator Entrepreneur Program that aims to develop Black-owned businesses in South Africa. Mr. Harper's educational background is in economics and waste management. Um, so Wayne, I'm going to ask you to please introduce yourself and your organizations, especially your work as it connects to food waste. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, so, so really our organization was founded in 2015 to, to provide a, a local solution to food waste. Um, it was really born out of uh, out of my passion for for home gardening and and deciding that I actually had a resource in my house that uh, I was not using. Um, and uh, through a lot of research and a lot of trial and error, uh, we have developed a low tech solution to to taking post consumer food waste mainly, um, and putting that through a process where we we ultimately use it as a feedstock for. Um, red wiggler worms, and we produce a soil ameliorant or, or, or fertilizer um, from the worm castings. Um, so uh, there's just a few numbers there of the, of the food waste that we've recycled, uh, close to, uh, uh, we're, getting, we're getting close to our target of, of getting to, to uh, 5 million tons uh, in the first uh, seven years of operation. Um, and this has a significant impact both on our corporate clients because they are uh, closing the, the waste cycle 
um, but also having a significant impact, uh, which is becoming more important to them, of uh, sustainable best practice um, and, and ticking some of the ESG boxes that are, that are now becoming uh, vitally important. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So because we're dealing mainly with post-consumer waste, uh, source separation is, is, is one of the key topics um, and systems that we've had to develop um, in our business. Uh, this is a lot of education, um, really trying to uh, get food based where it is uh, generated, uh, separating it there at source and ensuring that that separation is maintained. Um, anyone who is in the food waste space, particularly the post-consumer space will know that uh, contamination is a constant battle. Um, and and the, key, the key thing for, for us at the end, we're, we're trying to um, use this as a, as a resource for, a, for an end product, is the cleaner the waste, the, the simpler our process is. Um, because we're dealing with a mixed food waste source, uh, we use uh, Bokashi, uh, which is a technology developed in Japan. Uh, it's very simple, very natural uh, anaerobic process, uh, which vitally for us allows us to uh, stabilize the waste on our client site. Uh, that leads to further reductions in, in sort of carbon footprint by having to collect waste less often um, and, and importantly not having any vermin or, or, or pest issues on site. Um, we then take that precaution treated waste and we take it to our offsite composting or agriculture facilities. Um, there, primarily, we're looking at an initial thermophilic composting phase, which will effectively pasteurize the waste, eliminate any pathogens um, and seed germination in our end, end product. Um, and then our final step is, is obviously uh, putting it through our worm farm. Uh, this is a mesophilic or a sort of medium temperature operation and, and look worms are nature's way of returning any waste to back to the soil and, and making it bioavailable so uh, they're pretty amazing creatures and we've used them uh, and their special uh, special powers to to help trans transform the waste as as john mentioned uh, Food waste should not really be seen as a waste, but rather a resource that uh, we just haven't uh, used as yet. And uh, for us at Urban Farms, uh, the worm plays a vital role in, in returning that at, as the highest level product that we can produce. Um, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, the key, the, the key things are, you know, I think uh, my main area, my focus area in this discussion will be uh, source separation and on-site separation. Um, it's, it's, it's been the key thing that, that we've developed uh, in order to, to try and clean up and, and, and make sure we've got a resource that we can um, put into a process and produce a, a product that's efficient. Um, and, you know, I think this is, this is sort, of, sort of key area where we're looking at policy as well. Some of these things have to, have to go into, into policy discussions. Um, but, you know, there's a policing, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a mixed uh, bag of, of things. And, um, you know, where, where we started was, it was more of an environmental decision. So, so getting buy-in for people was very much uh, doing the right thing. Uh, but if we want to make this a pervasive system, uh, we do need to have um, policies and structures and processes to enable everyone to do this because uh, we need to, we need to um, treat food waste uh, as a whole if we want to make progress in, in reducing the carbon, uh, carbon footprint of, of this waste. And, and in, in fact, largely to reduce this as a waste. Um, yeah, if you can just go to the next slide um, and just show you some of our facilities. Uh, we, we're trying to build a, a nationwide um, network of, of, of facilities. Um, you'll see some large scale, our, our facility in the Western Cape is, is a pretty large scale composting facility, well situated. 
Uh, we also have a, a permaculture plant there that's producing uh, around about 100 tons of vermicast per month. Uh, some of our sort of more inland facilities are, are nearly compost. Um, vermiculture really allows us to, to turn food waste one into compost, which is relatively low value um, from a consumer perspective into something that is of, of a higher value, uh, more fertilizer product in the, in the vermicast. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to to get stuck into the discussion. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, that was really interesting. I've heard of Bokashi composting and I've actually attempted it myself, but was unsuccessful. So maybe I should ask you afterwards how I can um, fix the way I'm doing things. Um, so yeah, so now we'll start with the uh, discussion portion of this panel. Um, so we will be alternating between the panelists with different questions, starting with Emily and then going to John and then finally Wayne. However, um, if any of you have anything that you'd like to add to the conversation, feel free to do so. So um, Emily, uh, your first question is, what food law issues does your law school clinic prioritize? Are there certain issues that are common and are frequently brought up by clients? Yes, thank you so much. It's it's um, a great question. Um, so I would say, you know, I mentioned already in my opening remarks that we do a lot of work on food waste, food recovery, um, and I think that that because of that, and because um, you know there aren't a lot of people in the legal field working on these issues, that is certainly one of the biggest areas that we get lots of questions on. So. For example, I mentioned that we do some work at the state level. Um, we've now in, in many different states, we've been asked to put together like legal fact sheets that state agencies can give out about the laws on food donation. So we're doing that right now in New Jersey. We're finishing them up. I just got an email this morning with edits to one of those. Um, and then we're also working in New Mexico right now where there were some questions about um, protections for food donors and in particular for gleaning that really came up during COVID. And so we're kind of preparing both um, sort of guidance on what the laws are now and then suggestions of how they can strengthen those. Um, kind of bigger picture, there's a lot of questions that we've worked on historically and even more so in the last year and a half related to food justice and food equity. Um, so, you know, we're doing a couple of particular projects in that area. One that um, that I'm really um, committed to has been around uh, policies in the U.S. that allow for foods to be made in home kitchens, which I think evidence shows that the most people that benefit from this are women, people of color, and immigrants who, you know, for various reasons are kind of at home, have trouble breaking barriers down to get into starting other businesses like restaurants, but may have real skills with cooking and preparing food. And in particular, after the last year and a half of um, the pandemic, a lot of people that worked in food service didn't have their jobs and they had a set of skills. So we've seen actually in the last year, 55 different state bills were introduced to broaden the amounts of foods that can be made in a home kitchen. And we've been working on this here in Massachusetts. I had one of my students give testimony this week in the Massachusetts legislature on state law here. Um, and then we're working in a couple other states too. So um, that's just you know a couple different things that we're that we're doing. Um, I could go on. I mean, I feel very lucky. I get to work on really cool things and and get to kind of help my students get involved in this and and do the hands-on work as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. Um, and then our next question will be for John. So what are some challenges that Vanguard Renewables has overcome in terms of establishing anaerobic digesters for communities? And what is the greatest challenge it currently faces in expanding the use of anaerobic digestion? I think, uh, maybe I'll take it in reverse order. I think probably the, the greatest challenge is educational. Um, and just letting folks understand that this is a constructive pathway and to uh, really illustrate how impactful it can be both to their um, carbon signature as well as the farm's carbon signature and 
being able to really highlight all the attributes uh, of, of farm based recycling of, of organic materials. Um, for us, I think a lot of what we had to do, um, again, when we kind of saw what had happened uh, in Germany and Denmark and the UK, um, we kind of thought it would be an easy transition here in the States. Um, uh, nothing could be further from the truth in, in, in that we're, you know, we're very stuck in kind of our, our traditional modes of, of throwing things away uh, and not recycling and not separating materials uh, to, access the, their unique capabilities. And so we had to really spend the time both uh, educating our direct generators. Um, we had to, to help communities understand that digesters are wonderful neighbors uh, and not nasty neighbors um, and really work with utilities to make sure that we could get that energy out of the systems and into the grid um, to decarbonize uh, both either the electrical or, or natural gas grid. Um, so it, it was a lot of education, a lot of building understanding, um, a lot of really kind of grassroots work to let folks understand that, that this is a pathway that's, that we think is, is significantly preferable and, and significantly more beneficial um, to all of the members of that, that circularity. Thanks, John. Um, later on, we're gonna ask you a question that you kind of alluded to here. Um, so that was very helpful. Thank you. I'll be ready. Uh, so, for okay. <laughs> um, Wayne, your first question is given the innovative nature of your system, it sounds as if you perfected the process through plenty of trial and error. What advice would you give to an organization that's trying to implement the same process so that they don't repeat your mistakes if you had any? Uh, lots of mistakes. <laughs> I'm only just starting to get positive with worms. I have uh, killed a few of them in my time trying different things. Um, I, I think the key thing for me is any, you know, any process where you're changing things in order to get um, to a better system is not to change too many things at the same time. Because uh, if you do that, as soon, as soon as you do that, you don't know which is, what, what has actually worked. Uh, so the, the crucial thing, and we did learn this a little bit of uh, trial and error as well, is, is that you've got to keep as many of the variables uh, stable as possible in order to actually understand what the small changes you're doing, um, are they having an impact that, you, that you're seeing? Um, you know, one of the key things for us as well, and, and one of our big social issues in South Africa, um, it is, is around employment. Um, so our systems are, are, are pretty, I would say, low tech. Uh, we looked at, uh, if you look at vermiculture in, in Europe, it's, it, it's mechanized. Uh, there's quite a lot of the tech involved, where, whereas ours is, is, is really low tech. Um, it's human powered. Um, and uh, again, it's, 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 the whole business is, is around uh, creating a network of, 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 of hands that are, are taking local food waste and, and turning it into a resource. So yeah, in terms of the iteration, it's definitely taking time um, and, and controlling the variables so that uh, you're able to measure um, and understand what changes uh, have been effective. Uh, so that has been key for us and it takes time. All right, great, thank you so much. That's um, very interesting to hear. And we're going to circle back to Emily um, I really like the social justice perspective that you um, touched upon in your previous answer. Um, so next question is, um, so in constructing anaerobic digestion facilities, how can we center community voices and concerns to achieve the most just and sustainable outcomes? And which stakeholders should lead the implementation of anaerobic digestion in a community? Um, and if you don't work as much with anaerobic digestion, I guess just um, talking about like achieving food, strategies for achieving sustainable food systems in general? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll kind of do both. And thank you for the, the two options. And I'd also be curious to hear John's perspective on this point too. Um, you know, I know, you know, John alluded to like being good neighbors. And I think there's a lot of like fear on the part of communities for both anaerobic digestion and compost facilities as well. Um, so um, let's see how to answer all your questions. I think one piece I would say on anaerobic digestion that that um, to me, you know, really relates to some of the justice questions is really about um, 
um, making it accessible to um, different um, different parties to be able to start these facilities. And you know, it's really expensive. You saw the pictures of the technology. I mean, it requires like a lot of um, upfront, you know, costs and then ongoing costs. Uh, one thing that we worked on earlier this year, I mentioned we did this U.S. Food Loss and Waste Action Plan with three other organizations. And our very first recommendation in there was that the federal government should give more money to um, states and localities to do kind of food waste policies and planning. So uh, a number of states have put in place restrictions on food waste going to landfills, states and cities in the U.S., I think the policies are really well done at the local and state level because you can get a lot more input from different parties. The enforcement is really done at the state and local level, but there's not always the money there for the cost of, of creating these facilities. So we worked with um, those, those partners on legislation that was introduced in Congress called the Zero Food Waste Act that would give money from, um, you know, Congress would give it to the Environmental Protection Agency and would give it to state and local governments to develop a range of, of um, you know, policies that would reduce food waste and would kind of support development of this infrastructure. Uh, one of the aspects that was included in that in light of these concerns was that there would be a um, priority on grants to diverse locations and for diverse uses and a priority on grants for, for organizations that would use the grants in communities of color, low income communities and tribal communities that are disproportionately affected by the human health and environmental effects of you know, climate, food waste, poor food systems. So I think that you know, there's both the aspect of you know, doing planning at, as much at the state and local level as possible, but then you know, where we have funding coming from the federal level to help support that, particularly in communities where there's less resources to kind of build that infrastructure and then really thinking about how can we make good jobs for, you know, a diverse set of community actors um, so that, you know, we're really spreading out this opportunity as this economic opportunity grows. It's uh, interesting that you say all of that because our next question for John <laughs> is now, um, how can we expand the use of anaerobic digestion into low resource areas of the world? Yeah, and, and, and I, I would even follow on from, from Emily's EJ question. You know, environmental, if you look at, at, at what we're looking to supplant, we're, we're really trying to move away from landfills and incinerators as, as a method of disposal and really move to a, a recycling model that, that makes a whole lot more sense. And if you look at the siting, and, and I know there's been some significant studies done on the environmental justice piece of siting of incinerators, landfills, and transfer stations, they are consistently, um, and, and, and to the great extent, located in low-income and minority communities. Um, and being able to move these materials away from those communities um, and, and really be able to take the organic stream and get it on farm um, for us it, it is, is a critical kind of next step in terms of how you start to reduce the, the environmental justice impact of food waste in general. Um, I think from uh, how do you move the technology to um, folks, because Emily's a thousand percent correct, the, these they are very capital intensive systems. Um, they require training and upkeep, the you know, annual maintenance, uh, especially when they're done at scale. Um, it is something that, that is probably daunting to a lot of communities. And I think um, we're huge fans of federal incentives for the construction and the upkeep of systems uh, throughout the, uh, any community. Um, what we also see is a really wonderful spot for the NGO community in developing countries as kind of sponsoring the smaller scale anaerobic digestion, you know, in rural communities, in urban settings, um, where you can take that, uh, the energy that's derived, um, it requires a policy commitment um, to allow, usually in developing countries, um, the local uh, utilities, the gas and, and electricity are usually governmentally owned or controlled. Um, you need to have the community have the right to make their own energy. Um, that is not always uh, a given, uh, but being able to take it kind of at, at the level of, of, you know, putting together the capital putting together the policies that allows a community to be self-sustaining, um, to take its own uh, organic waste um, and maybe even purpose-grown crops 
So you can grow corn, sorghum, uh, other silage crops, and actually put those into anaerobic digesters to make energy. Um, really exciting, uh, but it requires the initial capital for the construction, an ongoing capital commitment for the operating and maintenance, um, uh, initial capital for training, um, and then really a follow-up uh, to make sure that 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 continuous training that there's there is a an understanding of how to keep the digestion. Because if you look at most agricultural digesters that were built in the United States over the last um, 50 years, uh, most of those were kind of dropped off at the farm uh, and ended up failing uh, because they weren't kept up. And I think that that is a model that you wouldn't want to see replicated as you take the technology um, into other locations. all oh, great insight thank you so much um and sort of continuing on this topic of justice um our next question for wayne is how do you incorporate a social and environmental justice framework into your systems look i i, I think in, in in our in our country or the developing world um seeing this as an economic activity and and a, and a a local economic activity is a, is a vitally important thing. Effectively, this is a, is a, is a whole new business opportunity for communities. Um, and and the, the nature of waste is, is, is that it is local. Um, so, so having systems and having businesses that can transform that waste locally is, is, is a great opportunity. Um, and that's really what, you know, the, the important thing, especially uh, the Organics Association of South Africa, is, is where we're looking. Uh, you know, our government has realised that there is they've got this dual problem of we've got a waste problem. Um, one, it's understanding that waste, and, and, and Emily could certainly help us out with with proper legislation because um, we're trying to get what, what I call the leftover food that is still. Um, perfectly good for consumption um, in, in, a, in a developing world needs to actually go to a human um, to, to sustain them. And then, and then secondly, identifying what is actually real waste uh, and that needs to be returned to the soil. You know, in, in the developing world, we, we've got a good opportunity in the, the agricultural space, um, looking at, at exporting. Um, you know, our agricultural sector in South Africa is actually very well developed. Um, but but there's also opportunities for smaller scale producers, um, and it all it, it's all about building the circular economy. Um, and and for us in South Africa, it's it's brand new. So um, and also do think that uh, sort of the local authorities and, and government uh, don't necessarily understand the, the costs of landfilling, and, and and maybe those those costs are not uh, wholly wholly mapped out. Uh, they certainly don't have the environmental costs uh, uh, in there. Um, but again, for communities, as John was saying, these are often cited in, in, in sort of lower income or, or, or downtrodden communities. That's where landfill is. Um, and there's a big justice issue around that. It, it, it's, it's, it's not right. And, and we need to have policy. We need to have business. And we, we need to work together to actually um, change the entire system. If I can, can add on to something Wayne said, because I think, um, you know, there's, you point to one issue, which is that um, it's really difficult to figure out how can we encourage food being do, diverted away from the landfill, but also remembering that there is sort of a environmental hierarchy of where that food should go. And that the first best thing is if that food is been prepared and gone through all these phases to be safe to eat, that it should go to people. Um, and I think that becomes really tricky. And we've seen um, certainly in different state policies and different countries policies that, you know, how do you navigate um, prioritizing that, but then making sure that if that doesn't work out, that food then goes to processes like, you know, vermiculture, compost, and anaerobic digestion. And I think that's really tricky. And the other thing I wanted to say was that we, we worked a couple of years ago, um, you know, just very small support, but to a case in, in the Lahore High Court in Pakistan, where the court actually found that um, food waste is, is a, a abridging the right to food. And what they said is, you know, the right to food includes the right for food not to be wasted if that food is safe to eat. And that that means there's a duty on government 
to actually put in place policies to ensure that that food doesn't get wasted. So here in the US, we don't recognize a right to food, which I think is part of our problem. But, you know, I think many, many countries do. And, you know, thinking about this, that there's that there's a duty on government to make sure that food that is good to eat gets to people and then figuring out how you um, triage that, it, you know, go to the next stop on that chain if that isn't able to happen. And um, that is also kind of, a, you know, a big opportunity and a big question. Yeah, I think uh, I remember your slide. If, if you looked at uh, your orange circles and your blue circles, that really does highlight it. You know, if we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, that orange circle was tiny because because people almost bypass the law. You know, it's 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 almost uh, it's desperation. I, I need to I need to eat that food. Um, so I, I think it's a balancing act about what is safe, and and obviously we're also dealing with corporations and the, and the producers of this food are, are particularly aware of of the impact on their business if something goes wrong. Um, so so it, it's definitely a balancing act. Uh, but you know you, you, your 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 map showed it. Uh, you know that's that's really the sort of economic situation that we find ourselves in. Thank you both for those insightful comments. Um, so now we're going to be moving a little bit away. And um, Emily, we would like to ask if you could name one thing that you're most proud of in terms of your work with food law, what would it be? Um, there's, I, I feel very lucky. I mean, I'd say maybe on the project side and then just you know, I think one of the things I feel the most lucky about is that I get to work with great students. And so taking a pause to really thank Kiara and Claire for moderating today and just, you know, the amazing work that students can do and um, in like taking your time to do this and think about these issues and learn all the things you can learn to be part of the change. Um, so that when I think about, you know, I've been doing this about 10 years. I started the clinic kind of roughly 10 years ago. Um, the number of students of mine that have now gone on and are in local or state or federal government, um, you know, former fellows and staff of my team that are now like leaders in their own right doing work in food systems and environment and food justice. Um, so that part is just utterly, you know, probably the best of all of it. Um, as far as, you know, project that we worked on that I was proud of, I mentioned earlier that um, the, uh, the US Farm Bill, which every five years we enact this law that has a whole bunch of money in it, nearly you know, $500 billion worth of spending for a five year period of time that goes to support farmers and getting food from point A to point B around the US. And prior to the last Farm Bill, there was zero dollars, zero mention of food waste and food recovery. So we're spending all of this money to produce food and we're not spending a dollar to really think about how do we make sure that food ends up on someone's plate instead of in the trash. Um, so we were, before that farm bill, we wrote a report that said, um, here are 16 things that could go into the farm bill that really fit well, that fit with the mission that could start to divert food from being wasted. And um, a number of those, about seven of them actually in some form or another made it into that farm bill. Um, so we're now kind of working on the next one and getting ideas together. And um, but I thought that that was just really exciting that we got you know a foothold in really prioritizing this issue um, and and sort of saying this is a national priority. We need to um, invest in the resources and the awareness and the technical assistance if we want to actually make an impact. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and then next question for John. Um, so are you optimistic that anaerobic digestion will become the standard food waste management system in this country at both the industrial and residential level? What about globally? And if you're not optimistic, what needs to change first? So I think it's gonna be a tiered approach um, and, and anaerobic digestion, we really believe has a, an incredible seat at the table. Um, what we want to direct to anaerobic digestion is, is unusable food. Um, and what we don't want to take is, is food that can obviously go to, to help folks who are at, are at risk. Um, but I think there is there's such a large level of endemic food waste in the food manufacturing process in the United States 
as well as um, the very, very um, sincere amount of food waste that comes out of the home. Um, and I think between those two, there's more than enough recapture capability. Um, and, and really, we don't want to be having to touch stuff that could be repurposed, uh, could be repurposed as animal feed, could be repurposed as uh, for human consumption. That, that's, those streams have to make it uh, to their appropriate uh, destination. But anaerobic digestion um, could supplant something like 15 to 30 percent of the total natural gas usage in, in the United States. And that, um, because of the carbon negativity, could actually take natural gas uh, and make it um, a net zero fuel, which would be um, our greatest hope uh, for really changing um, the impact of methane on the environment. Thank you so much. And then on a similar note for Wayne, we're wondering if you're also optimistic about the future expansion of vermiculture in South Africa and why or why not and what factors are limiting its expansion? Uh, it's certainly excited. Um, I, I think I think for for us the excitement is is what I'm going to call sort of micro operations or really small small scale local. Um, just uh, in my dealings with Arasa, uh, we we've now got a group of of sixty vermiculture practitioners uh, around South Africa uh, that have formed a little sub working group, um, and yeah, it, it's it's definitely got potential. Um, there's a few things that need to happen. Uh, people need to value the worms castings a bit more. Um, uh, and, uh, but it's all, it's all again, I think John alluded to this, you know, what's the biggest challenge is it's definitely education. You know, I think we, we, we're all at the sort of a forefront of a very new um, industry and uh, our jobs as almost founders and entrepreneurs is, is more education than anything else. You actually have to educate your customer to say that they need your solution. <laughs> they, they don't come to you. You've got to tell them why they need your solution. So um, I think that's the challenge, but certainly exciting. Um, and for us, again, as I alluded before, it's 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 a key to to job creation and and a good job creation. You know, there's a big move to to hands-on uh, the food system, micro farming, even in the US. You know, we 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 we've seen what happens in the US market and COVID, and COVID has has shown us so many things. You know how how important a local food system and a robust food system is. Um, and if you're relying on big supply chain, uh, we've seen big problems in the in the supply chain. That sort of just in time, large international supply chain has, has fallen down during COVID. So if you've got access to a good local farm, uh, they need to be your friend. And I think that's that's the key to us in this sort of industry is, as we effectively providing an input to farmers and uh, transforming a waste stream uh, to, to, to provide that. And, and I think that's uh, that's the crucial thing and that's the exciting part. Thank you oh, so thanks. much. I'm, I'm glad that you're excited for the future. And um, so now that it's one o'clock, I think we're going to be moving on to the Q&A session with the guests. Um, we have a few questions. So I guess we can start with the first one. Actually, never mind, because the first one is directed to John, but he had to leave, unfortunately. So uh, we will move on to the next question, which is from Naurika. Uh, she's wondering, how difficult is, is it to push for a greener approach to food waste? How can the Global North take responsibility for their role in creating a circular economy? And this is directed to anybody who would like to answer. It's a huge question. It's a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, um, kind of, you know, appropriate in, you know, a lot of the discussion that that is, you know, goes on at COP26, at COP like what is the role of each of the different countries, especially countries that have benefited from a lot of, you know, prior development and now, you know, taking kind of responsibility for that. Um, I can't answer all of that. I will say that, um, you know, I think many of the global companies are based in, um, in the global north. And so I think um, you know, things, a lot of companies now are, are putting out sort of sustainability commitments, zero waste commitments, et cetera. 
Um, I think a lot of it's used as a marketing tool. So it's great that companies are doing that, but I think that um, it would be great to see more of, you know, home countries for those companies making more of those requirements or, you know, digging into what are, what are those commitments that companies are making? How actually, you know, how real are they and how much are companies actually meeting those metrics? Um, so, you know, I do think that, um, you know, we've all talked about that there's a lot of opportunity for change and it's really just about some of the friction that's keeping us from getting there. Um, so, you know, I think that's sort of one starting place. I would say as well that, um, you know, and I think we've all three mentioned in different ways um, requirements, uh, you know, to reduce food going to landfill and the ways that those have now led to um, more innovative solutions. So whether it's, you know, compost or anaerobic digestion or donation, uh, here in the U.S., for example, Massachusetts has a restriction on food going to the landfill, and they saw that there was a 22% increase in food donated, even though it was, it's not required, it's just like you can do anything with your food except send it to the landfill. They saw a 22% increase in donation. Um, there were actually 500 jobs, new jobs created in anaerobic digestion and composting and food rescue. And it actually created more um, revenue for the state just by treating food as a resource. So, you know, I think that there's sort of, um, uh, you know, everyone's scared of having a, a policy that's a stick, but actually the stick policies are not only better for people and for the environment, but actually are creating jobs and value. So, you know, I know that's sort of just one piece of it, but I, I agree the responsibility is there and we need to figure out the ways to, to take you know, to take that responsibility. Wayne, I'm curious what you have to say yeah, on this too. I think, I think, I think from the global south, uh, I, um, I guess, I guess probably leadership. I, I, I really think this whole, you know, what we're talking about really requires leadership, um, and it, it's going to require people to stick their necks out and, and maybe yes, go with the stick approach. But uh, but otherwise, you know, I think. We certainly see it here that the sort of blue chip or international companies that are here are certainly playing a leadership role in 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 wanting to divert their their, their waste and and trying to achieve that zero waste to landfill and 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 taking the lead in that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's it, it's almost collaboration and leadership is is what the world needs in in this in the space. We we. Um, something's got to change. So <laughs> um, it's, it's good that we've got Kiara and, and, uh, and Claire leading the way from the youngsters uh, because they're going to be crucial uh, in, in following this through. Um, but, you know, with, in the light of COP at the moment, we need, we, we need promises to be stuck to. And that's probably not, you know, it's going beyond food waste. I think that's, that's to the whole sustainability of the, of the planet. Um, you know, from, from, from my side, uh, we, we're only scratching the surface. John was talking about a sort of negative um, a, a carbon signature of, of, of things. And, and, and for me, you know, the soil covers the entire planet or the entire landmass of the planet. And that's a huge tool for actually reversing climate change. You know, the amount of carbon that can be sequestered just by soil microbes, uh, let alone plants, is is significant, um, and I think that's something that, uh, as a, as the planet, is important. Um, we've actually got to start ticking back the clock, not uh, just stopping it. Right. Soil health and how that's going to be um, taken into is going to be so essential. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Wayne. So we've lost some people, but we're going to continue. And there's, there seem to be some shyness among the audience, but I'm glad there are some coming in. So please continue to put in the questions. Um, this is your time to ask the question to the esteemed panelists. I want to ask your question, Emily. There is a question from Maddie. Um, you mentioned conflict between regulation in food marketing and freedom of speech being an obstacle in your work at times. Um, Adi, it's interesting knowing if you could expand on how that's been an issue and the balance or struggle you found between First Amendment rights and public safety sustainable policies. 
It's a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll give a little answer, but I will say, you know, it's sort of very US specific because we have this phenomenon of the First Amendment, which is very beautiful in a lot of ways. It protects speech, it protects, you know, political activities. Um, on the flip side, um, I, I will say I've been, you know, teaching now for 10 years and about um, maybe five years ago, I added a whole day to my class on the First Amendment because it started to become um, a challenge to so many different things that were policies we were looking at in the food system. And part of that is the way that our courts interpret the First Amendment with regard to the speech of companies. Um, so over the decades, the courts have given, have, have brought in the protection more and more. Previously, uh, that protection was really for like political speech and artistic speech, you know, things that we think of as being core parts of our First Amendment. Um, and starting in the 70s and with more and more protection since then, we've also said that applies to the speech of companies. And what that means is that when we've worked on policies where we either want to not allow companies to say things because they might be misleading as to health or safety or environment and sustainability, that's been really difficult or when there's been efforts to require certain labels. So for example, um, uh, there's now at the US national level a required label for genetically modified foods, but there were previously states that were trying to do that at the state level. And there was um, companies were bringing those cases to court basically saying the first amendment wouldn't allow us to require that labeling on foods. The same has been coming up with things like warning labels for um, sugar and health reasons that lots of other countries are using things like, like you know, um, stop signs on foods that are really high in certain um, ingredients that are harmful to health or that are, you know, perpetuate diet related disease. And those things are really tricky here when they come in front of courts. Sometimes they haven't been able to go forward. So, um, it's been, it's really interesting. I actually, it's a little bit depressing, I will say, because I think that it, um, the trajectory of the way that courts are interpreting this is just kind of giving more and more protection to companies. That said, it's a, it is still a limited area. It's really around labeling. Um, some of these other regulations that are more like you can't send food to the landfill or things like that don't get caught up in that um, First Amendment landscape. Thank you, Emily. Uh, so our next question is for Wayne. Um, somebody is wondering, are you engaged with students in local communities as well as farmers to help educate about the value of your system as a solution to a big problem? Yes, absolutely. We work with a number of uh, sort of education institutions. Um, particularly around that, trying to, to engage and develop uh, entrepreneurial um, systems. Um, you know, because we're urban based, it's mainly sort of peri-urban peri farmers, um, so sort of fairly small scale, high intensity farmers. Uh, we work with the University of the Witwatersrand. They've got a, a project called Is It Now Is It Goodler, which is, is trying to um, strengthen the, the food system in, in the local townships. Um, and localize it and, and through that um, create employment and, uh, and businesses. Uh, so we do quite a lot of work with that and, and that's really um, involves about actually taking the waste that's being generated in that food production system and returning it um, as a resource. Uh, so it's really closing the loop in, in that small farming uh, operation. Um, so yeah, def definitely. Um, and as I said before, you know, I, I think our role these days is, is really to start off as educators and, uh, and hope that more and more people uh, get involved. And that's, and that's the key to building that momentum. So there's a question from Kathy. Um, Prepackaging pre -packaging of food and selling in fixed quantities or sizes or amount is very convenient for business. But does it contribute to consumer food waste? Could we reduce food waste simply by changing marketing methods to allow people to buy the quantity they actually want? Oh, I think absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's that's really addressing the sort of what I'm going to call on farm or in, in food system 
uh, waste. Uh, it's a huge problem uh, as you, uh, in your introduction, you know, one third of the food produced is, uh, is wasted. Uh, and that's before it even gets to the consumer. So, so it's, you know, there's are some in, innovative things. I don't know if you've ever come across agri fruit and veg. Uh, they, they, they really a campaign about uh, out of spec vegetables. Uh, you know, we all like to go to the supermarket or the store and, and see a perfect apple. Um, but what about all the ones that don't look as perfect, you know? Um, and I, I think it's educating around the fact that, uh, you know, that, that is still nutritious food. And, and particularly in our developing world scenario, we, we need to really focus on, on that. Um, you know, our, our economy is, is, is quite dichotomous, if I want to put it. We've got a very first world side of South Africa, and then we've got a very uh, third world. So, so we see that play out, you know, in the sort of high-end retail stores, you, you won't find. There's a lot of packaging. There's a lot of um, uh, perfect veg, you know, that, that, so that equals a lot of waste in that system. Uh, but then on the other side, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of direct to to um, consumer selling. If you if you go into the townships and in the cities of, of South Africa, it's the food is 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 sold by vendors that are on the side of the street and doing exactly that, selling bunches of spinach or uh, for people on the way home. And also um, in economies where where people don't necessarily have the ability to um, shop in in bulk or at scale. Uh, food actually becomes a daily occurrence. Um, and, and I think there's opportunities in looking at, at that as a system. It's, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know? there, there's far less waste when you actually, you, you buy something and you consume it that, that day. It's, it's, a, it's a need. So um, that's why you'll see in, you know, um, in, in Emily's map, we, we don't have a lot of post-consumer food waste in the lower end of the market, but we do have it at, you know, it's sort of that first world market. Um, so definitely, I, I think, you know, it's not only packaging and labels, but but it does actually come down to, to buying what you need. Um, uh, lifespan, you know, there's a lot of living produce in stores rather than pre-packaged. Uh, just to, we need to do everything to extend the shelf life of, of the food we 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 get it to reduce that that waste. Can I add in just one or two things? Of, yeah. of, sorry, sorry, Wayne. Uh, and also, you know, the one thing we've got to, specifically on the labelling thing is is everyone here sees best before as the day you've got to throw something away, which is we, we need to remove best before and just have like an expiry date that's you know. It's 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 really, you know. I always say when I when I speak to people, if you've got something in front of you, you know if it's good to eat or if it's not. So you don't need a you don't need a best before date. Just look at it. I was gonna actually say a word about date labels too, but I think um, you know one thing we've worked on it for a while here in the U.S. is we actually have no standard date labels on our products. So a couple of years ago, Walmart did a study. And they found that um, in their stores, there were 47 different labels used. Sell by, best by, enjoy by, use by, package on. I mean, I can't even name 47. It's like, you know, it, very, companies can get very creative apparently. Um, but I, we found out in our research that the US is so far the only country globally that doesn't have any national law on this at all. So I would say like, you know, I know from the work we've done in South Africa that it's our, that it's an issue there. We're even steps behind that because we don't even have a label that is communicating clearly quality versus food that is being labeled because there's a safety risk. And I think there are a couple of countries doing this really well. Um, there's kind of an EU-wide policy, and then the UK because they've been part of the EU, um, they also have that, but they've elaborated even more. So there's. Um, foods either have the words best before or used by. And if it's best before, then that means that those foods are labeled for freshness. There's no risk after the date. You can eat it. They've done huge campaigns to businesses to say, please donate after that date because it's still perfectly safe. And then to consumers too, saying, you know, for those foods with best before, as long as it smells and tastes fine, there's nothing wrong with it. 
the biggest risk is that it would be stale and it wouldn't taste as good. And so therefore, you know, don't eat it. But, um, but I feel like in the U S we don't even have that. Like we haven't even kind of told people which are the foods that are fine and which aren't. Um, and I think the other thing I wanted to say that's, you know, this question is really um, on point about is that there's um, one big challenge is the nexus between food waste and packaging waste. And so in some places they really can align, but there's also some challenges where as we, for example, try to donate more food, um, often that food needs to be packaged in some way to, to kind of make that, it's adding a step on the chain essentially. So sometimes we see that, you know, if we're not thoughtful about that step of donation, we can create kind of more plastic waste and things like that. So that's a thing that I think is really important to keep in mind. Um, and I'm also curious, Wayne, from your experience, I know having talked to, um, you know, folks who run anaerobic digestion and compost facilities that the packaging of food is actually like a total nightmare. If they get a bunch of food sent to the facility, they actually have to depackage it in order to process it. And I'm not sure from your end if that's been an issue or um, like how you handle that. If you get, you know, how do you get it all out of the package to be able to start your process? No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so, so I mean, we, we if we're talking pre-consumer waste, that's generally cleaner because it's coming out of a manufacturing facility. Uh, uh, so that's that's a bit different. But yeah, any any sort of uh, expired food um, or waste coming out of kitchens, contamination is is a huge uh, is a huge problem. And and you know, a particular bugbear of mine is is. Uh, these single use containers, you know, if you go to a, a hotel, you know, why does the butter have to come in, in a plastic tub? Um, you know, you know, if I, if I look at, we're going to look at anthropologists are going to look back on us in, in hundreds of years time and think that all we ate was plastic uh, butter containers, jam containers, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scourge. And, and I, unfortunately, I don't think, I think health concerns around COVID have actually exacerbated that. I think there's there's more waste now because oh someone has may have touched that and, and it's got to be disposed of as soon as it's gone to the table. So so th there's certainly challenges and it, it, it's it's a, it's a whole mindset. Thank you both. It's yeah, there's so many challenges that come with food waste, um, but hopefully we can get past them. <laughs> Um, and so I think this last question is from an anonymous attendee, and um, they are asking, what are examples of major policy barriers we are facing for scaling up anaerobic digestion and composting or regenerative agriculture in general? I think I can start there. One of the exciting things that, that has happened in South Africa of late is, is uh, there's actually been a relaxing of, of uh, legislation around um, facilities that compost uh, food waste. Um, and I think anaerobic digestion would be included in that. Um, uh, they've, they've gone from a, a system which was quite uh, uh, sort of insistent on legislation to, to adopting a more norms and standards. They, they've, they've understood that there, there is this problem and uh, there's a potential opportunity to create small scale operations to 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 help eliminate the problem so there is definitely been a relaxing that moved to a norms and standards as of uh, june this year it was actually gazetted um but again it, it, the wheel turns quite slowly so the, the key thing is actually more sort of enforcement um uh, that's that's related um I can understand the sort of policy is, is let's 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 try and get some facilities up and running and then we can we can start uh, uh, becoming more strict on, on on enforcement because we've got the offtake. Um, but yeah, I mean there's it's definite requirement uh, for the large scale adoption. Yeah, I mean I feel like you know weighing your answer is so you know, you have the on the ground experience. Um, I think for my end, in terms of what we hear as being challenges, um, the biggest one is cost. And I get that that doesn't sound like a policy challenge, but it is. 
because we're we're sort of allowing all these externalized costs in the food system right now that you know um uh you know that we're not we're not addressing um but then you know the lack of investment in this as a solution or or the enforcement against companies of saying you can't just continue to um, throw food away because that is wasting resources and causing um, really high methane emissions. Um, so I think you know a policy barrier is the decision on the part of government to not invest in these infrastructures that need some upfront investment to get them going. Um, the other we've also heard similar to what Wayne said in the U.S. that the permitting of anaerobic digestion and composting vary from place to place. And some states are further along and sort of there's a playbook. If you want to get your facility started, you kind of go, you know what you need to do. And in some other places, it's sort of like, oh, you have to call the right person and then they'll tell you and you have to, you know, you're kind of like running in circles trying to figure out where to get started. Um, and I think that's a place where, you know, one recommendation we've made before is that there's kind of opportunities for um, maybe like model um, permitting and regulations from that states could all be using. So whether the EPA could put something like that out or, you know, on a more global scale, some of these things are, you know, aren't, uh, there's sort of best practices for the way to do that permitting that we could learn. Um, and then the other issue that's come up sometimes in the U.S. Um, is around zoning and just where facilities are allowed to locate. And so, um, you know, this happens at all different scales. We were involved years ago, several years ago in Boston was writing new zoning rules for urban agriculture in the city of Boston. And people wanted to be allowed to do small scale composting at urban farms. And it was a huge issue and they ultimately allowed it, but on a very small amount, it's only like, I think it's like less than 3% of the property can be used for composting and you can't bring in external materials. You can only compost the materials from that urban farm. And so again, I mean, I think if there's no locations where you're allowed to do composting, um, and urban digestion, again, you know, might need a larger footprint, but um, but really thinking about um, you know, making it easy for these entities that we know are playing a role in social good um, and not making it so that you need to jump through so many hoops to be able to raise the funding and figure out what you need to do in order to start a facility. Yeah, thank you so much for the very rich conversation in food waste, compost, and anaerobic digestion issues. And we talked about packaging and it, it was just so, I feel it's so rare that we can hear the perspectives from companies in the global south and global north together with the academic perspectives on these issues. Um, so I, I really want to thank you all for such a great uh, discussion and also the audience for the great questions that you've provided. Um, since we are almost out of time, but I was wondering if we could finish with a very brief concluding remarks. Um, and I was curious if you could let us know about, you know, some kind of solutions that you're excited about for climate change and maybe your wishes for COP26. Um, so that we can end with uh, hopeful, solution-oriented um, uh, ideas from you. If you can start with you, Emily. Yeah, um, big, big question with a short time. I mean, I think you're right. We talked about a lot of things here. Um, I mean, one thing that I've really seen from our global work on food donation policies is just how much opportunity there is for countries to be sharing with one another. And that's sort of you know a big part of COP26. Um, I think one challenge when you look at where food plays a role in this is that there's so much to cover. So I think I know there'll be some discussions about food and agriculture. I think having more opportunities to kind of really continue those conversations and have more um, sharing of those policies that are working really well would really be beneficial. Um, you know, I think. Uh, um, the other thing I really want to see is sort of, again, in light of our conversation, investment in policies that move the needle forward on the contributions of food to climate, and then also on supporting food producers and um, the greater food ecosystem in, in terms of adaptation, because that's coming to, and when I think about farmers and food producers that already are really suffering from 
um, drought and wildfire and you know other kind of impacts of climate that's an incredibly important thing um, that that needs to be um, you know addressed in this in this forum. Yeah, very true, Wayne. Yeah, I, th I think uh, thinking COP twenty six, um, the, the the big the big elephant in the room to me is, is is the impact on climate change on food security. I mean, we're talking about food waste, but food security is is a huge issue. And us uh, us here down in the south, uh, we we may be bearing the brunt of 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 some of this, um, and we're certainly at the most risk. Um, but I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I, I think uh, regenerative agriculture is uh, is gaining momentum, um, and I think it's really got the ability to change a lot of things. Uh, you know, there's this perception. I think it's I think it's disappearing, but that that organic or regenerative farming is not able to feed the planet, um, which is absolute uh, nonsense, in my opinion. Um, and if we do it properly, uh, we really, the word regenerative says it all, uh, we, we can. And uh, yeah, I, th I think from my side, I, I think as a, as, as a planet, we need to work together more. Um, we need to share, we need to have more platforms like this and, and, and uh, have dialogues um, from North to South and, and we can all learn from each other. Um, but what I really hope for is just a real commitment from 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 the powers that uh, change is required, and we actually need to see some some boots on the ground uh, making those changes. Um, so we need to have a lot more conversations like this. Yeah, that's very true, and especially the COP twenty seven is going to be in Africa. I believe that food and agriculture is going to be very important as well, and food insecurity, as you mentioned. So, thank you so much. I would really like to thank all the panelists, John, Emily, and Wayne, uh, for sharing your experiences, knowledge, and wisdom in this session. Um, as we try to create a prototype for anaerobic digest digester on Emory campus. With equity by design mindset, uh, we hope that we can actually rely on your advice uh, and then continue the discussion. Food waste is a low hanging fruit that needs to be tackled to mitigate climate change and solutions that are available as the panelists have shown us. And so I hope that you all have been inspired to move forward with hope in the future as I have through this panel. And let's take a moment to give the virtual round of applause to the panelists uh, who work on this very important intersection between the food waste and climate change and tackling the climate crisis every single day. So thank you also goes to the organizers of this conference and everyone for participating and contributing um, in a very great way with the discussion and sharing your ideas and sharing your um, whatever information you have available for you. And thank you, Kiara and Claire, uh, for moderating the panel. Um, I'm, I, I hope that we were able to go over all the questions, but we are sorry if there were more that we couldn't get to. And thank you, Delaney Kuhn from the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and Leah Thomas from Emory Climate Talks for doing all the work behind the scenes as well. So Zero Emission Solutions Conference concludes today, but I hope that you will stay tuned for the event next year. And please check out the recordings that was on the chat. And I hope that some of you will join the Emory Climate Talks webinars as well in the future. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, enjoy the COP26, whether in person or virtually. And let's continue pushing for climate action. So have a great weekend. Thank you so much. <laughs>